All right, good evening, everyone. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, I can't just tell you how overwhelmed I am right now to see all of you here. That just goes to show how important this topic really is. So I do appreciate you being here. Uh, for those of you who don't know, I'm Andre Nicholson, a professor of communications here at Middle Georgia State University. And obviously we're here because there's a very important social topic that we need to discuss. We have a very distinguished panel, which I will introduce briefly. And we will start with Dr. McManus. Dr. Manis, I'm sorry. Dr. Manis is a professor of history here at Middle Georgia State University. He teaches a course on religion, race, and ethnicity in American life. In addition to being a professional historian, he is an ordained Baptist minister with a PhD from Southern Baptist Theological Seminary. Dr. Manis. Thank you. Um, Rudy Giuliani does not like uh, the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, you would think a high-powered lawyer such as he uh, would understand something about context. Um, the slogan, Black Lives Matter, uh, and the movement are defensive responses to a long, unrelenting history of white supremacy and black denigration in our country. Uh, because, of, because of what America has repeatedly said to the sons and daughters of Africa, there is a great need for our country to be reminded that black lives matter. But from Jamestown to Baton Rouge, St. Paul, Dallas, Charlotte, and God knows where next, um, America, white America, has often told African Americans that, that their lives mattered less than people with white skin. So uh, to, to look at this history, you can, you can at least start as far back as 1640 uh, with a Virginia law that punished white runaway indentured servants with three to five extra years of servitude, but black runaways uh, were forced to serve for the duration of their lives for the same crime. Uh, or consider the anti-slavery clause that was in the original uh, Declaration of Independence. Uh, but that could not stand up to Thomas Jefferson's eraser. Uh, the delegates took out the clause uh, that said uh, that uh, the lives of Southern slaves mattered less than the need for 13 unanimous votes for independence. 11 years later, and a revolution later, the Constitution's framers could not muster the moral courage actually to use the word slaves, and so for the purposes of representation in Congress, they compromised their way into counting these other persons as three-fifths of a human being. Uh, within another three years, the first Congress under the Constitution passed the Naturalization Act of 1790, which limited citizenship to any alien who was a free white person. In effect, that law defined uh, American as being white. Uh, you, you, you can move on through uh, the entire history of, uh, uh, of uh, white-black relations uh, in this country. And um, even, even when white America has uh, gotten it right, uh, it still couldn't get out, of the, get out of the way and make an error. Uh, when Lyndon Johnson addressed the nation to announce the Voting Rights Act of 1965, he alluded to the murder in Selma, Alabama of white minister Reverend James Reeb. He neglected, however, uh, to mention the earlier murder of black civil rights worker Jimmy Lee Jackson. Uh, and so uh, when you look back through all of American history, 
uh, if white America had not implied in all of these instances and some that I didn't mention uh, that black lives mattered very little, if at all, uh, if white America had not consistently said this to, um, to black America, no one would feel compelled to say uh, that even uh, black lives matter. Um, the uh, black flesh, black lives may never be loved by white Americans, but they must be protected. Um, and, uh, and they must be protected because all lives matter. Um, and our history has, has been a history that has uh, denied that uh, from our very beginnings until, well, last night. Um, so it's high time uh, that we heard the message of this movement, and it's high time white America heard the message, and got converted. Thank you, Dr. Manis. Next we have Dr. Adria Goldman. She's an assistant professor of communication at Gordon State College in Barnesville, Georgia. She teaches courses in public speaking, interpersonal communications, organizational communication, public relations, and mass media. She earned a PhD in mass communication and media studies from Howard University. Dr. Goldman. You know, when Dr. Nicholson asks us, what did we think, or why was this discussion necessary? And, and it saddens me because we see why it's necessary with what's happening right now. Um, we see what's going on in the news. We see what's playing out on social media. So that tells us exactly why this is necessary. Um, there's an issue that has to be addressed, and we can't address it unless we're willing to discuss it. Um, another reason why I think it's so important to talk about um, Black Lives Matter specifically is because I think there's a misconception about what that movement means. Um, and, and it's from both sides. I don't, I don't want to say it's you know one group versus the other, but I even think some people who say Black Lives Matter or hashtag Black Lives Matter don't truly realize what that movement means. It's more than just the hashtag. It's more than just saying, I matter today. Right? And they even say on their website, this isn't a moment, this is a movement. Um, so often when people, when you see on social media, especially when someone says black lives matter, there has to be a response. Yeah, but what about all lives? Well, what about blue lives? But again, if we educate ourselves on what this movement really says, it never said that no one else mattered. It meant that we want to be included in a conversation that has traditionally left us out. There's a two behind it that we might not see, but if we consider that context, we understand it. Black lives matter too, mm -hmm. okay? On the 16th, on the 7th, excuse me, I put a status on Facebook because again, as all of this plays out, we see it on social media. We see conversations that are, again, uncomfortable to have, but necessary, and it's great that we're together where we can actually talk. But I wrote a status that says, if I say black is beautiful, it doesn't mean that others aren't beautiful. If I say I'm black and I'm proud, it doesn't mean that others should be proud. If I say black lives matter, it doesn't mean that other lives don't matter. But for a group who has historically dealt with being told they aren't beautiful, they shouldn't be proud, and they don't matter, those sayings are important. So with that being said, I proudly say black is beautiful, I am black and I'm proud, and black lives do matter. Okay, so that's, what, that's one of the things that I hope we can get from this, understanding the true meaning of Black Lives Matter. If you go to the website, it talks about empathy. It talks about engaging in conversations, not just with black people, but allowing black lives to have a part in that conversation because traditionally we have not had a role in that conversation. I think it's important that we are willing to identify our own prejudices and how that is contributing to the issue. I think it's important for us to acknowledge the role of mass media and how it is helping to create this us versus them, and we feed into it. So I think the reason why this is important is because in order to stop this issue, or at least to acknowledge the true issue, we must be willing to have those difficult conversations that Dr. Nicholson identified earlier. Thank you, Dr. Goldman. All right, Mr. Aaron Lewis is an undergraduate student here at Middle Georgia State University. His major is business and information technology with a focus in management. He's been very active with the university through multiple clubs and organization, most notably his role as president of Brothers of Leadership and Distinction, also known as BOLD. Mr. Lewis. This isn't a topic that's uncomfortable for me because it's not hard for me to tell you that my life matters. It shouldn't be hard for anyone that's black 
to tell you that their life matters. So for us to have this kind of discussion tonight, uh, the importance of it should be easy to see. If you're black, you should know that your life matters and it shouldn't be in question. If you're white, you should know that your life matters and it shouldn't be in question. If you're an officer, I'd like to thank the officer in the back for coming out tonight, you should know that your life matters. However, tonight we will only be discussing Black Lives Matter. I do believe all lives matter, but for me to say that Black Lives Matter and for you to say that all lives matter, uh, it makes me feel as if you want to exclude the direct reference of Black Lives Matter. Uh, I use it as a metaphorical tree. If all lives matter, then every branch on that tree should be important to you. Well, Black Lives Matter is just a branch on that tree. And currently, modern day, we see, every, we see this branch in particular dying off. Um, it's only in America that we can tell you that you have the right to be free, the right to assemble, the right to protest. But when you choose to not stand for a national anthem, you're criticized. It's only in America that you can comply with the police, you can raise your hands, and still be shot in the back. It's only in America that they can pass laws, and it still will come to no avail because they won't be exercised as they should. It's only in America that our police is allowed, not all, but majority of police are allowed to practice guerrilla warfare and not use the simple art of war. The military is trained to not kill first. If you look at it, the military is trained in a manner to where they will try to stop you, disarm you, immobilize you before they shoot to kill. Why aren't our officers held to that same standard? It's only in America that a badge can relieve you of the consequence of what is actually murder. They just call that another day on the job. It's only in America that they can justify the non-sentencing of a white rapist from Harvard, but justify the murder of a young boy playing in the park with a toy gun. It's only in America that they can justify the protection of a serial killer, but the murder of a young boy in the street. It's only in America that you can shoot to kill instead of just trying to immobilize, and I cannot stress that enough. It's only in America that they can tell you not to be prejudiced, but be prejudiced against black people every time they choose to organize. And I won't get too deep into that because I know we'll discuss it later tonight. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lewis. All right, next we have Mr. Jeff Tarver. He's a lecturer in criminal justice here at Middle Georgia State. Mr. Tarver is a graduate of Columbus State University where he earned a Bachelor of Science in Criminal Justice and a Master's Degree in Public Administration. From 2008 to 2013, he was employed with the Georgia Department of Juvenile Justice where he served in various capacities to include corrections, probation supervision, and tactical response teams. Mr. Tarver is also a proud member of Omega Sci Fi fraternity. Mr. Tarver. I personally say black lives matter. And again, I'm not saying that all lives do not matter. Um, but when we see things happen in the media, um, not just in the media, but happen on day-to-day -day, uh, situation, you know, as a black male, it, it kind of, it does something to your psyche. You know, when I get pulled over by law enforcement, I'm proud of law enforcement. I, my skin starts to crawl, like, oh, Lord. You know, you know, I don't know, you know, I know how to, you know, engage with law enforcement, but it's still something in the back of my mind because there's things that you see on a day-to-day -day basis. But let me, let me give you a scenario. And I, I, I always feel as if it's hard to understand what, or empathize with another group of people if you've ne never actually gone through what they've gone through. So let me give you a, a short history lesson. And instead of black people going through these things, it's going to be white people going through these things. So let's go back to about 1600 or so. You had Africans that said, we want economic opportunity and we want to be free of religious persecution and of course there's some other reasons. So we're going to go to this newfound land. And before we get there, let's stop in Europe and pick up some Europeans. So we'll come up with some trade deals so that we can get them on this boat and we're going to take them over to America. And once we get these white people to America, this is what we're going to do. We're going to beat them. We're going to take away their religion. We're going to take away anything that they know. If we find out that they can read, we're going to kill them. Um, anything else. Um, not just that. Um, we're going to classify them as property. 
They're not going to be people. We're going to classify them as property. Once we, um, fast forward a little bit, once we emancipate them, quote unquote, which Abraham Lincoln did, uh, we're going to come up with something called the white codes and vagrancy laws so that white people, once you've been emancipated, if you don't have a job just because you just get off the slave plantation, guess what? That's illegal, right? Or if you walk on the same sidewalk as a black person, that's considered illegal. And we're going to come up with this thing called the convict lease system. So that that same plantation that you just got off of, guess what? We're going to send you back because we still have these fields that need to be tended to. So you white people need to get back to work, OK? So not only that, let's fast forward because I know we don't have a lot of time. We're going to put you in a system called Jim Crow. So we're going to make sure that you're segregated, separate but equal. Plessy versus Ferguson said that was OK, OK? Um, we're going to cut off white people's ears, their noses, their genitals. We're going to hang them. We're going to burn them. We're going to meet at the town square so that all the black people can come and watch us burn you, right? And then we're going to sell the body parts as souvenirs so people can buy them, OK? Let's fast forward a little bit more. Um, once you start trying to get your stuff together and, and, and form what's called a, a white Wall Street, we're going to burn that to the ground, OK? So once you start mobilizing and start to do something for yourself, we're going to burn that down. We're going to give you syphilis in a controlled environment, right? And let you have it for 30-some-odd years before we actually give you a cure. And by this time, you've given it to your wives and anybody else that you had a relationship with. Let's fast forward a little bit more. Um, instead of Emmett Till, we're going to kill Ethan Till for whistling at a white woman. And the people who killed Ethan Till, guess what? We're not going to hold them accountable for their actions either. Let's forward, fast forward a little bit more. Uh, we're going to kill four little white girls in the church. And then the director of the FBI is going to sweep it up on the rug for 40 or so years. And eventually, you know, we might hold some people accountable. But, you know, you might die before we actually hold you accountable for that. We're going to put drugs in your communities. You can, you can research the Iran-Contra scandal. Uh, we're going to kill your leader, so anytime you try to mobilize, we're going to infiltrate it. Look up COINTELPRO. We're going to create laws in order to impris uh, imprison you for decades. You can look up the, the war on drugs. We're going to give you inadequate education, all right? equalization schools, things of that nature. When you do finally get a chance to get into black schools, we're going to spit on you and call you everything else under the sun. We're going to redline your neighborhood, so if you want to live in a black neighborhood, nope, guess what? We're not going to give you a loan. You can't live in that neighborhood. Okay, FHA, uh, they were complicit in this as well. We're going to make sure that white people do not get access to funds in order to live in certain neighborhoods. Once you do actually get the right to vote, guess what? We're going to come up with these different tests to make sure that you can't pass it so you can't vote. Okay? Then around 1965, 64, 65, 68, we're going to turn you loose, okay? We're going to say, okay, all bets off. We're sorry. Well, not sorry, but go back and pull yourself up by the bootstraps, right? And then 50 years later, we say, hey, you know, it's over with. You know, all that stuff is in the past. So you, you need to just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and, and get yourself together, OK? Now, after all that, once you start to revolt and rebel, when your people are still being killed in the streets, we're gonna, and you say white lives matter, we're going to say, no, 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 no. All lives matter, not white lives, not just white lives, all lives matter. And not only that, just think about that. If the shoe was on the other foot, would you be peaceful right now? Probably not. Let's look at our history. Anytime America has wanted anything that they didn't actually possess, how did they get it? War, genocide, and deceit. So how can you get mad at black people for saying black lives matter when we're doing the same thing that America has done forever? But I digress. So I know we got to move on. Thank you, guys. All right, and last but not least, let me first say, uh, this is Ms. Gwinnett Westbrook, and she was so nice to come fill in for me at the last minute. Um, originally, the state president of the NAACP was going to be here, but some scheduling conflicts, he was not allowed to come. So she is the president of the Making Bib NAACP. So I really appreciate you stepping at the last minute. 
Um, as I said, she's the president of the NAACP here in Macon Bibb. She has been employed for the state of Georgia for almost 11 years as an independent case manager and previously worked at the Medical Center of Central Georgia Hospital for 22 years. The NAACP is the oldest civil rights organization that exists. We were formed in 1909. We were organized by a group of blacks and whites. Uh, a lot of people don't know that, but they were formed by blacks and whites because of the injustices uh, that were handed down uh, to blacks and minorities. <coughs> the key to a lot of this is going to be education. A lot, and, and I say this over and over because people are, people know what we're saying when we say black lives matter. I do believe that all lives matter because of the NAACP has always been a, a diverse uh, organization of diversity. But when we say black lives matter, people <coughs> understand what we're saying. We're not saying that all lives don't matter. But this discussion has to take place. We have to face these issues head on. We can't put it, push it up under the road. We have to deal with it um, head on. Back even when the voters, um, um, back in the 1960s during the Voters' Rights uh, Act, even today, we're still facing the issues of not being equal. In 2031, blacks' votes, voting rights expire. So when we were, uh, the Voting Rights Act was, law was passed, it wasn't forever. So why not? Why are our voting rights, we don't have the same right to vote as white men and white women. Our voting rights expire in 231. Lawyers have to go back into the courts to justify why we still need to vote. So tell me what's wrong with that. Also, mass incarceration. That's a big issue we, we need to deal with. We need to deal with it head on. These are things that are happening in our community that exemplifies and shows us every day why black lives matter. Washington Post reports that more black, more white men are killed by police than black men. But black men make up 54% of that, and they're saying that only 14% of black men and women are being killed by police, but I'm not seeing that. And I believe if that was happening, then it would be on the, in the news and in the media as much as it is when, some, when a black person is shot and killed by an unarmed officer. I do believe that we have a lot of good officers, but we have a lot of bad officers. And we have to acknowledge that racism and discrimination still exist. We try to teach, we have on our Facebook page, um, not our Facebook page, our website, what to do if you're stopped by the police your rights, your do's and don'ts, but is that enough? If you're doing the right thing, you still may get killed. So I think it's, this discussion today is very important because education is a very big part of our society that we need to deal with, especially with our young people, because a lot of, not saying that they don't, but Believe it or not, whites know more about our history than we do. They know more about our history than we do. And I think that we, as a lot of young people, we need to look at our history, where we come from, how we got here. That's going to be very important for you to deal with what's going on in this century. Thank you so much. Thank you, Ms. Westbrook. I came up with a set of questions that I'm going to pose to the panel. Um, these questions come from my conversations with friends, family, my community, um, and things I've seen in the media that I feel have not been answered and should be answered. Um, and so I just created a set of questions that I think are relevant to this topic. I'll pose those questions to them. Each of them do not have to answer the questions if they don't like. All right, first question. Critics of the Black Lives Matter movement have categorized it as a terrorist group that includes, that, I'm sorry, that incites hate against law enforcement how do you respond to those critics? 
Um, a lot of us will, when we hear Black Panthers, a lot of us, the first thing we think of is violence. We think of them attacking people. We think of them being militant. We think of all that kind of thing. However, the Black Panther Party was created as a part of a self-defense and education on the political system for black people. They, they did a lot of community service for uh, black youth. They would do uh, morning breakfasts for the youth. They would do uh, edu after school programs for the youth. They did a lot of things that the black students didn't have that white students did. Now, how is that a terroristic group? How is that group terroristic? How is that group going to be militant? How is that group going to be an aggressor to the government? All that group did was be revolutionary. And again, if you don't know the definition of revolution, you'll think bloodshed. However, revolution just means to overthrow a government or change it to a new system. So the Black Lives Matter movement is considered a terroristic threat because they're revolutionary, because we want to have a new system in place to where black people not only have equal rights like they fought for in the 60s, but also have an equal justice system like we're trying to fight for now. Honestly, my generation, this is our fight. Our parents, our grandparents, they had their fight. They, this, ain't, this isn't their time. Our time is now. It's our time to fight for an equal justice system. If you don't let that sink in, yeah, you have, this, you have the same right to sit in this auditorium together. We have that. After this, we can go all out and eat together. However, if you, go to, if you go to court and I go to court for the same thing, you'll get off a lot easier than I will. It's just that simple. Jerome, stereotypical black male name. Brandon will say that's a white male. If Jerome gets caught stealing from a store, he's gonna catch a charge. If Brandon gets caught stealing from a store, they're probably going to give him a slap on the wrist and say, don't do it again. Harvard, in, we're going to put this in real world, Harvard student raping females while under the influence. How do you justify saying, uh, I feel as though if I give him a prison sentence, that could be detrimental to his future because he has such a bright, bright future and uh, high potential? How can you justify that? How? Why don't I have such a bright future? Tell me. Tell me why my future can't be bright. Tell me why I can't be somebody special. And it's because I'm black. So yeah, call me terrorist. Call me a revolutionary. But I'm going to tell you my life matters, and I'm going to die fighting for it. Um, first of all, I think the fact that Black Lives Matter, the movement, is often called a terrorist group is more evidence of why we are continuously saying Black Lives Matter. Because when you see this group getting together and they're not the right skin tone, something must be wrong. They must try to be violent. They, may, they must try to attack us. They must try to do something. Okay, so I think that's one way of trying to take away credit from what is trying to be done. That's number one. My second thing is that I think, again, the way that some individuals use Black Lives Matter or the way that individuals refer to the movement, I think it is a result of the lack of knowledge of what this movement really stands for. If you look through the guiding principles, um, acknowledging, respecting, and celebrating differences and commonalities. Even with restorative justice, we are committed to collectively, lovingly, and courageously working vigorously for freedom and justice for black people and, by extension, all people. So if you really educated yourself on Black Lives Matter, the movement, you would understand that it's not a terrorist attack. It's an attempt for them to become, for black people to become a part of a larger conversation. And I even think that, again, it's, it's all about education. I remember being on social media once and there was a, a meme of looting in a QT and the hashtag said, Mike Brown Monday. And a black male, hashtag Black Lives Matter. He thought that he was doing something that was beneficial. He was, you know, he thought he was saying, this is what we're standing for. This is what it means. We're going to loot. Okay, but what's the, if I ask him, what's the meaning behind that? Or, you know, why are you really saying Black Lives Matter? What do you want? He wasn't able to answer me because I literally asked him. So my thing is, if people actually educate themselves, black people, white people, I don't care what shade, if you educate yourself on what the movement is actually there for, and even when we say Black Lives Matter, even if we aren't trying to support the movement in particular, we have to realize that the way that we say it, again, it's a large, it's a big issue. 
So we have to acknowledge that when we say that, we are impacting perceptions of the movement. This, this does not just start. Um, there was a Black Lives Matter back in, in doing the uh, Selma March in, uh, uh, in, in the, uh, Alabama. There was a, a Black um, Lives Matter when um, they, they boycotted the bus with Rosa Parks. When, when, when this did not just start. So people understand what Black Lives Matter means. This is, it, we're just in a new day and time. We got another, a, a different type of generation um, that's uh, leading this uh, Black Lives Matter. And like other panelists say, I don't care what color they are. It can be a black officer that shoots and kills somebody. I don't care what color the officer is, but unfortunately that's not been the case that's been happening. And it seems that White officers are able to refrain their self from killing a wh another white person rather than being able to re re uh, refrain themselves from killing someone black. We're all doing the same thing, but for some reason, it's being treated different. And um, I'm not understanding what the such an uproar is as far as why we're saying that black lives matter, which all lives matter, but the issue is not the same. So we just need to understand, like she said, we need to uh, be educated on it, but people are already educated on it. They know what, they know what we're talking about. When uh, the political culture is such uh, that uh, all you can ever express about America is that we are exceptional, um, it, it makes it almost impossible for whites to hear legitimate criticism of our own history. One of the things I, uh, I, I learned recently is that most white people, literate white people, have never read a book authored by a black person. Uh, when you think about that, uh, you, you can understand how white America, who has been taught we're the greatest country that it's ever lived, and anybody who criticizes it, who criticizes it must be uh, crazy or ungrateful or whatever other names they've called Colin Kaepernick. Um, and so, one last example of this. Uh, Anybody in this room, whatever color you are, uh, if you could have, if you could listen to Michelle Obama's speech at the Democratic National Convention and not be moved, uh, if you could hear that, what she said, and then especially when she said, "My daughters wake up every day." In a house that was built by slaves, and uh, and what did the how did the right respond to this? Oh, there they go again. They have to talk about slavery. That's what I'm saying is that uh, somehow or another, uh, our parents, our teachers, our preachers have got to somehow say, look, we have a great country, but we have made mistakes and we have done wrong, and uh, it's time for us to quit acting like uh, we're perfect so we can fix some of that which is wrong. I want to talk about something called cognitive dissonance. So when we talk about everything in white America that we've been taught, right, we're going to found this nation on principles of Christianity and things of that nature, right? But at the same time, we're going to commit a, a complete act of genocide on Native Americans and also, you know, become very barbaric with African Americans. So how can I go to church on a Sunday, right, and then turn right back around and go home and beat my slaves? So we got to understand something. It's a psychological thing. So when people start revolting and rebelling, we have to come up, you have to weigh in order, we have to find a way in order to eliminate that dissonance, if that makes sense. I have to figure out, okay, there must be a reason why these people are acting the way that they're acting, right? 
there must be a reason why I have to beat this slave. There's people that said, you know, African Americans don't feel pain as much, and African American women are just sexual beings and things of that nature. So if I can find a way to psychologically accept, you know, what I'm doing, and I know it's wrong, right? And in, in, in my mind, I know it's wrong. But at the end of the day, I have to sleep at night. So at one point in time, you know, it was a point to where if, if a law enforcement officer killed someone, you know, I just need to make sure that I have the story straight, right? And if nobody else saw it, then it's just my word against theirs. Well, a dead person can't talk. So now that you have social media and phones that have cameras on it, right, now we're catching stuff on camera. Now, and this is why black people are getting pissed off is because, okay, now that you see it on camera, you still have to come up with a way in order to justify people being executed. So if he just would have complied, he'd still be alive, even though he was unarmed. So I think it's more of a psychological thing. You know, we have to be able to justify, you know, the reasons people are being treated certain ways. Thank you. Most of us understand that police corruption and systematic racism in many areas, particularly our justice system, has been going on not just years or decades, but for centuries. However, people, are, people who are against the BLM movement state that they are, they are focusing on isolated incidents and making the issue larger than it is. How do you respond to those people? I do not agree with that. I see it every day. It's, not, it, it's in our courtrooms. Um, it's in our school system. Um, so, I don't see the incidents being isolated. Uh, I just think that people that are against the Black Lives Matter movement is, is, is isolating the incidents. Mm -hmm. um, when you get complaints at the magnitude that, that we do with our judicial system, they're, they're doing it in, with papal opinion. They're murdering our uh, uh, black men and women with paper and, and paper opinion. Um, when they're, they're being shot down on the streets, it's the same thing. If you, if you get a life sentence and you're in prison for 30, 40 years, that's just like being dead. In our school system, uh, our, our kids are not being um, taught. Uh, our kids are, we have a higher rate of, of suspension being put out of schools. Um, so I disagree with that, that they're isolated incidents. You have to look at the, the entire picture. Everything that deals with society, education, health. If you don't have insurance and you go to the hospital, you, you, most likely you're not going to be treated. But a person of another race, they basically know what they need to ask for. It's all about education. They need to know what they need to ask for in order to get treated. So it's about educating. I don't think it's, it's an isolated incident. I'd say if it were isolated incidents of, of uh, young white boys getting killed, how many, of, how many isolated incidents would you tolerate before you got busy and tried to change something? <laughs> I think it's really difficult to call it an isolated incident. When you look at today, um, the private prison system is really just a modern day slavery system. Right. I think it's really hard to call it an isolated incident. When 40 states, I just looked this up, CNN has a report that over 40, at least 40 states, these were the only ones to turn it in, 40 states have invested more in their prison system than their education. It's true. Now tell me, if you really want this country to be great, and I don't know how you want to judge great, but I judge great on a different scale, so I can't say America is, great, is as great as we want to say it is. But if you really want to say a country is great, why would you not invest more in education and more into reform and not into retention of your prison system? Now see, we have a problem with retention in college, but we don't have a problem with retention in jail. If you gave me more money to go to college instead of putting more money in these, in, these, uh, in these jail cells, maybe I'd be able to go get my education. However, <laughs> however, you don't want me to be educated. There's something that you fear in that. There's something that, that knowledge, that you can't take away knowledge. 
you can't take away a degree. You can't take away the lessons, the books, everything that I've read. And that's what you fear. They don't fear us attacking. That's why all of that, let me tell you, my generation, listen, that's the wrong move, man. That's the wrong move. We don't need to attack them physically because that plays right into their hands. We need to attack them on a level that they can't, they can't say, they can't have a, an excuse to kill us for. If we attack them in the books, if we attack them in the courtroom, if we attack them in their pockets, they can't, they can't run from that. They can't run from that. If you learn, they can't run from that. They're going to try to lock you up, but guess what? There's books in jail. Get out and keep learning. All right, Ms. Willis, thank you. Our privatized prison is more than just one isolated incident. Uh, in privatized prison, those beds, you have to keep 99% of those beds occupied in the prison. And census is reporting in 2020 that the minority is going to, the majority is going to be the minority. Black people do not realize how much buying power they have right now. We have 76% of the buying power. That means if we stop spending money, we can basically get what we want. Many have also stated that social media has only fueled the fire of racial tension. First, is that a good or bad thing when we consider that social media is the catalyst for that? And second, do you believe that to be true? Why or why not? I definitely think that social media does fuel this thing, and I'm glad that it does. Uh, I'm, I'm the type of person. I, I like my racism on a, on a silver platter. <laughs> um, I know that sounds funny, but I'd rather you tell me that you're a racist than for you to try to do something behind my back. Nowadays, what people do, they get real bold behind avatars on social media and say whatever they want to say. So I think it's still good to have people, to give people those outlets so that they can, you know, can voice their racism so we can still say, look, this is why we still act the way that we act. Because people are not just outright doing it. Some people are. But you see people in blackface and all this other kind of stuff on social media. And then once we point it out, it's like, oh, I'm sorry. Well, you know. So like I said, I think you know, it, it, it's much needed. And I'm glad that people still voice you know, their opinions in the way they want to voice them. What social media is doing is exactly what it needs to do. It's spreading the truth and it's spreading it in a faster way than any of us ever expected. I think it's a good thing to turn these things off every, every now and then. Um, but I, I will say that uh, w when it comes to this uh, sort of thing, um, it, it just oftentimes it generates so much heat and not necessarily very much light. Um, and and, it, 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 whether, whether you're talking about race or um, you know, whether you're a, a Alabama fan or an Auburn fan, everybody's saying things to people that is, uh, that is uh, coarsening the way that we talk to each other uh, as a society. Uh, it, 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 um, it, it, it gives us uh, more freedom uh, to say F you or whatever else we want to say to anybody we want to say it to. Um, I, th I think that uh, um, uh, the, the truth is there, uh, but, it is, but it's also creating uh, an anger um, about lots of different issues, not, not just race, uh, that, that I'm not sure is healthy for any society uh, to, to take a... a uh, um, um, a, a minority uh, view on the subject. <laughs> All right. This past month, San Francisco 49ers quarterback Colin Kaepernick made a loud statement with a simple gesture of not standing during the national anthem. Obviously, his protest generated backlash and criticism. What are your thoughts on this issue, and do you think it adds or detracts from the overarching issue? What Colin Kaepernick did was exercise the right that you or someone that you're related to fought for. Why should he be criticized for that? America, we can talk about how great it is. However, America is probably the most hypocritical country on the planet. We are the only country that will tell you that you're free, but then as soon as you choose to use your freedom, we tell you that you're wrong. 
will criticize you for it. America is the only country that will put our, will put our military into other communities, into other countries, and say, well, they needed us. But when we need you here, where you at? America is the only country that will use brutal force to fight for the rights for those in another land, but when we're here in our own home, we can't get those same rights. Back, back in World War II, black people used to have to go fight in other countries for other people, but when they got here, they didn't have the same rights. They were fighting for somebody else. You tell me what, what, what's really going on with this whole situation. Colin Kaepernick brought to, brought to light something I didn't even realize. Francis, Francis Scott Key the author of the uh, national anthem was a slave owner. So when he wrote for the home, for the free, he wasn't talking about you, he wasn't talking about y'all, he wasn't talking about us. Why would I stand for that? That don't make sense to me. You didn't write this for me. You didn't say I was free. You said I was still your property. And as long as I abide by your rules, then we're fine. Nobody had a problem with Colin as long as he was out there playing the, foot, playing the game. Nobody has a problem with Cam because he's still just playing the game. But if I take a stand for something that's a lot deeper than this game, you're going to hate me for it? You're going to burn my jersey? Come on, America. I think the way that people are discussing it is an attempt to take away from the issue because he was doing it before media got a hold of it. And then when media got a hold of it, people started discussing it, and then there was this, you know, he, and even when he found out that he was possibly offending people, he switched it up. Now I'm gonna take a knee. So I don't think his actions are taken away from the issue. I think the way that people are discussing it could be an attempt to try to take our attention away from that. I mean, some of the names that he has been called, some of the attacks on his, on his background, it is just, it's ridiculous. But that wasn't his intention. His intention wasn't to get media, to look at this, it wasn't the intention wasn't to get a fan base. He had a belief, and he was going to do this in support of that belief. So I don't think he was taken away from the issue at all. A lot of us don't stand up for what we believe in and what our rights are. More people need to do that. We need to do that more often. And I think that we will be better off. We have to. You have to stand up for what's right. If you don't stand for something, you don't stand for nothing. Thank you very much. We're running out of time. I know we wish we could go a little longer. I promise I will try my best to do this again because we have yet to get to some solutions we can talk about. So thank you. And I actually want to thank, thank Dana Casper who was helped organize and put all this together behind the scenes. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Please have a good night and a safe drive home. <laughs>